I watch a lot of science fiction movies, and most of the time, I watch them because they entertain me. However, every once in a while, I like to watch that rare breed of science fiction film that is more artistic than entertaining, more concerned with boundary pushing than with having a schlocky good time. But once or twice a decade, a sci-fi film comes along that can legitimately be called high art. And usually, that film goes wildly underappreciated for many years, before being uncovered by film historians and re-evaluated as the masterpiece that it is. Now this brings me to David Bowie. Thomas Jerome Newton is an alien. He has come to our planet in disguise in hopes of finding a way to shuttle precious water back to his drought-ravaged homeworld, where his wife and children are slowly dying of thirst. By selling bits of his alien technology, Newton is able to form a multi-million dollar corporation called World Enterprises that he uses to fund his space-bound project. However, other corporate interests, a new love, and the ever-present temptation of becoming human resist him at every turn. Before we really get started, if you could hit that like button, it would help me provide water for my thirsty family. If you really do like what I'm doing, make sure to subscribe to see more content. Thank you in advance. With that out of the way, let's get back to the subject at hand. In 1963, the American author Walter Tevis, made famous for his debut novel The Hustler, published his sophomore effort, a science fiction novel called The Man Who Fell to Earth about an alien who has come to Earth looking for a way to transplant his fellow aliens from their ruined homeworld, the novel, which Tevis himself considered a veiled autobiography about alcoholism and existential angst, proved to be a critical hit, though only a modest commercial one. After a failed attempt to turn it into a television series, the film rights were picked up by auteur director Nicholas Roeg. Roeg, who started his career as a cinematographer working with the likes of David Lean, Francois Truffaut, and Richard Lester, made a splash in the early 70s with his first directorial efforts, performance and walkabout. Much like Tevis, Rogue found his work heaped with effusive praise by critics, but wasn't seeing that translate into much financial success. Around the time screenwriter Paul Meyersberg began writing an adaptation of The Man Who Fell to Earth, however, Rogue released the horror classic Don't Look Now, starring Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie, a film that was not only beloved by critics, but also did well at the box office. Therefore, when Rogue took Marysburg's script to his British distributors for Don't Look Now, British Lion Films, they were keen to work with him. There was a brief negotiation period in which British Lion demanded more control than Rogue was initially willing to offer, but in the end, British Lion, with a 50% financial guarantee from American distributors at Paramount, agreed to let Rogue make his film, even giving him almost complete creative control despite their hardline stance at the negotiating table. Rogue's friend, Cy Litvinov, who he brought on as an executive producer, introduced him to actress Candy Clark, whose only notable film credit at the time was American Graffiti, and the two began a romantic relationship even though Rogue was technically married. Rogue gave her the script for The Man Who Fell to Earth, and Clark was subsequently the first person cast, in her case as the female lead Mary Lou. Clark had months to work on her part before anyone else was cast, and as a result she gives one of the best performances of her career. She also plays the alien wife, although she is altered so much you can barely tell. There were some hiccups along the way for her. She wasn't comfortable with the nude scenes, of which there are many, and she gave herself a few minor injuries throughout. In the scene where the alien takes off his mask for her, which she wasn't prepared for the first time and allegedly passed out, she had planned on throwing up in panic, but no matter what she tried, even Ipecac syrup, she just couldn't do it, which forced Rogue to improvise the following scene in which she pees herself. For the lead role of the alien, Thomas Jerome Newton, there was talk of Peter O'Toole, Robert Redford, Mick Jagger, and others, but most of these actors were either unavailable or too expensive. It became something of a problem because the financial backers wanted a big name in order to sell the movie, but they weren't willing to front enough money to hire any actors famous enough to be a box office draw. Rogue himself suggested casting his recent acquaintance, the sci-fi author Michael Crichton, whose height of 6 foot 11 inches would help him stand out, but for whatever reason, that had to be dropped as well. There is some debate as to who exactly first came up with the idea of casting the rising rock star David Bowie as the titular alien. 
Whether it was Rogue's producer friend Arlene Sellers, the famed film agent Maggie Abbott, or the film's screenwriter Paul Meyersberg, the one thing everybody agrees on is that it was a television documentary about Bowie's Diamond Dogs tour called Cracked Actor that convinced Nicholas Rogue that the British rock icon would be a perfect fit. It was his own personality being unable to cope with the circumstances he found himself in, which is being an almighty prophet-like superstar rocker. Not only had Rogue worked with a British rock star before with Mick Jagger in performance, he also wouldn't have to pay Bowie quite as much as he would a big-named actor. For his part, Bowie was enthusiastic about the idea, and he and Rogue formed a magnanimous working relationship. Bowie was having some difficulties in his personal life at the time and was also struggling with a pretty nasty cocaine habit, but by all reports he was surprisingly professional and humble on set. He may or may not have been doing drugs during filming. According to Clark, he honored a firm promise to Rogue to stay away from them, but Bowie himself has claimed he was doing cocaine on a daily basis. He did have a few minor and bizarre breakdowns during filming. For example, he became convinced someone had poisoned a glass of milk he drank, and he complained about having to work over an imagined Native American burial ground. But his acting style was consistent and agreeable. In later interviews, Bowie talked about how he didn't really understand the script or what was happening on any given day, but he memorized his lines and went in every day determined to give it his all. Though some critics have complained that the role is one big exercise in non-acting as they perceive Bowie to be just acting as himself, Bowie's performance is the unchallenged highlight of the film. Without Bowie, it's hard to imagine this film having the cult status it has maintained for four and a half decades. For the role of the patent lawyer turned business partner Oliver Farnsworth, whose name is borrowed from Philo Farnsworth, one of the primary inventors of the television set, they originally wanted to cast James Mason, but once again driven by a need to cut costs, they eventually turned to Buck Henry, famous for his role in the new Steve Allen show, his Oscar-winning screenplay for The Graduate, and for co-creating Get Smart with Mel Brooks. As Henry was a trained comedian, screenwriter Paul Meyersberg added new lines of dryly comedic dialogue for him, sometimes only a few days before the scenes were to be shot. While not exactly comic relief, Henry's performance adds a lightness to the film that would be sorely missing had the role gone to the more serious Mason. My father used to say, when you get a gift horse, force open its jaws and have a damned good look in its mouth. I'd say that was good advice. Yes, but my father was always wrong. For the role of Dr. Bryce, a college professor who quits his job to join Newton's company and eventually winds up in his inner circle and betraying him, they had to abandon their first expensive choice of James Coburn and settle on the character actor Rip Torn, who was well on his way to earning a big-name reputation. Also noteworthy is the NFL footballer-turned-actor Bernie Casey as the greedy tycoon Mr. Peters. The role was originally supposed to be much bigger, with Peters becoming something of a military leader and stand-in for the whole military-industrial complex, but during test screenings, audiences had a hard time accepting a black man having that much authority in American politics. Lastly, in the scene at the aborted launch, there are brief cameos from astronaut Jim Lovell and writer Terry Southern. On a budget of about one and a half million dollars, the film was shot over the summer of 1975 almost entirely on location in New Mexico, where right-to-work laws allowed the British crew to be flown in on tourist visas. With cooperative weather, gorgeous natural scenery, and a lot of veteran crew members who had worked together before, the shoot was a remarkably smooth one, even taking Bowie's occasional freakout into account. The producers showed an early cut of the film to the new head of production at Paramount, Barry Diller, who didn't like or understand it at all. According to British Lion's Michael Dealey, Diller refused to honor Paramount's contract, and so British Lion was denied its promised 50% funding. This put the production company in potential dire straits, but rather than suing Paramount outright, which would have been an expensive, time-consuming process with an uncertain outcome, they had to quickly shop the film around to other American distributors. I've come across some sources that mention a settlement between British Lion and Paramount over all this, but I'm not sure what exactly transpired from a legal standpoint. Regardless, it was a smaller company, Cinema 5, that agreed to buy a few hundred prints for American distribution and salvage British Lion's finances. Cinema 5 wasn't able to do nearly as much as Paramount could have, but without the company's $850,000 assistance, the man who fell to Earth wouldn't have gotten an American release, or possibly even any release at all. However, despite saving the film, and having a reputation for preserving international films in their original form, Cinema 5 wound up producing its own, butchered cut of the film that was borderline incomprehensible. For a couple of decades in the US, the only version of the film available was a pathetic, chopped-up shadow of Rogue's vision. 
It was Candy Clark who eventually tracked down the owners of the US distribution rights and convinced them to put out the full version of the film, which had to be recovered from the UK as all US copies had been destroyed. Now it is the Cinema 5 cut that is almost impossible to find, as every subsequent DVD and Blu-ray release has been for the full 2 hour and 20 minute cut of the film. In January of 1976, with only a few months left before release, the soundtrack had yet to be completed. David Bowie had originally been tasked with writing and producing the score, and he did manage to come up with a few tracks before Rogue rejected them. Reportedly, these tracks hadn't been synced to the film, they were wildly bizarre, and even Bowie wasn't particularly happy with them. As a result, Rogue gave the unenviable task of scoring the entire picture in six weeks to John Phillips of The Mamas and the Papas, who he had met a few years earlier while working on performance. Rogue envisioned a new score that would borrow heavily from an eclectic mix of American music, from pop, jazz, blues, bluegrass, and rock, along with a scattering of stock music as needed. The stress of the time crunch made itself known between Phillips and Rogue, who reportedly had a number of unpleasant confrontations. Thankfully, though, Phillips proved to be up to the task, as the soundtrack he delivered was so good that there was a campaign to get it released as an album, something deemed too expensive at the time. Because of this campaign, Phillips' soundtrack was finally released three and a half years ago, when Studio Canal and Universal assembled it for the film's 40th anniversary. The Man Who Fell to Earth released in March of 1976, and though it garnered a fair bit of critical acclaim and was eagerly gobbled up by Bowie fans, it was not a box office success. The American release was especially terrible, no doubt because of Cinema 5's hatchet job and lack of marketing resources, but even its UK release fell well short of expectations. It garnered controversy for its graphic nudity, a controversy Nicholas Rogue was familiar with after Don't Look Now, and it was given an X rating by the British Board of Film Censors, which no doubt hurt its earnings. Nowadays, the film is considered something of a masterpiece in science fiction cinema. Even some of the American critics who dismissed it at the time as a self-indulgent and confusing bit of David Bowie's self-promotion have come around to appreciating it, probably because the film they saw in the 70s was the Cinema 5 version. It is now not uncommon to find the film screened in college film courses, which is where I first encountered it a couple of decades ago. Make no mistakes, however. This is not a film for casual audiences. If you were to tell me you think this film boring and pretentious, I wouldn't hold it against you probably because, from a certain point of view, it is both of those things. It's also a terrible adaptation of the book, having so little in common with it that you could swap out the names and the title, and even the writer of the novel wouldn't accuse the film of plagiarism. That's because Rogue and Meyersberg weren't looking to make a straight adaptation, even though they both expressed love and admiration for Walter Tevis' novel. Instead, they wanted to look to the near future, tone down the overt science fiction and political thriller elements of the story, and create a romantic parable about the corporate takeover of America and the rejection of anything that fails to conform to its interests. On that level, the film completely succeeds. Watching it nowadays, it might not feel particularly provocative in how it presents America, because the corporate takeover they envisioned isn't too far off the reality of the 1980s. Sure, it has a bit of mustache-twirling villainy in how it represents corporate America, but it's pretty mild compared to the treatment corporations would get from even American films in the years that followed. I like to look at The Man Who Fell to Earth as a compelling demonstration of how individuality can be swallowed up, both by the overwhelming forces of society and by the imperfections of individuals. As surely as Thomas Newton is exploited, abused, and discarded by corporate interests, he is also betrayed by those closest to him and by himself. In the end, he is reduced to little more than the babbling alcoholic he encounters when he first arrives on the planet Earth. He is taken in by vice, especially television, sex, and alcohol, which are the three major obsessions of the film, and his ultimate ruination is as much his own fault as it is the fault of the evil Mr. Peters. Meyersberg, citing Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land and Richard Matheson's script for It Came from Outer Space, wanted to make the alien as sympathetic as the human characters, if not more so, and he didn't want to write any of his characters as puppets in a morality play. People behave like people in his script, full of foibles and imperfections and ultimately neither seeking nor earning any kind of redemptions for the mistakes they make or the pain that results. Newton, despite clearly being a tragic figure, is no exception to that. The best example, I feel, is the secondary character of Farnsworth, who starts out as a well-to-do but relatively humble lawyer who is propelled to greatness by managing Newton's financial interests and running his gargantuan multinational business. Farnsworth is a friendly, self-deprecating guy who happens to be in a lifelong, seemingly healthy relationship with another man. 
His sexuality is never explicitly mentioned or discussed, but when the powers that be come for him, it's hard not to conclude that he is being tossed aside, quite literally, because he is different in a way that is unacceptable. While we're on the subject, his bouncing off the glass because it wouldn't break the first time was a happy accident during filming. That wasn't scripted. I'm sorry. Now, as I said, this isn't a film for everyone. It's undeniably artsy and a bit full of itself, but for students of film and audiences who don't mind exploring the more artistic side of the medium, it's one of the best science fiction movies of all time. It's not quite on the same level as 2001 A Space Odyssey, but that's only because nothing is. This is a movie with a lot to say, some of which I still don't even understand, like the time displacement stuff, and it was made by an auteur who isn't afraid to be a little obtuse. It also contains David Bowie's best screen performance, with all due deference given to the Goblin King. Bowie is what makes this film work on every level, but even his amazing acting would be lost without the talents of the genuine filmmaking genius of Nicholas Rogue. At times unpleasant, at times a bit off-putting, and at times eye-rollingly self-indulgent, The Man Who Fell to Earth is nonetheless a stunning, beautiful work of cinematic art that remains an essential science fiction classic. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. What do you think? Is The Man Who Fell to Earth really high art? Or is it a pretentious bit of cinematic navel-gazing that's only famous because of Ziggy Stardust? Let me know in the comments. Be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't done so already, and if you really like these videos, consider becoming a patron to get early access and vote on future topics and more. You can also check out my website at emagill.com, where you'll find plenty more reviews of sci-fi classics in both film and literature. Until next time, when we'll look at that time Superman was defeated by a penny, this is the Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love. As long as you're not hurting anybody. Oh, a traveler!